Thanks for joining us for the SBP Podcast Mobile Filmmaking Episode 84. I am your host, Susie Botello. This episode is a fun discussion with Kimberly Hart. She's the producer of the feature film Madhouse, which won Best Feature Film last year, 2019, and she was also in San Diego for the International Mobile Film Festival, where this film actually screened first screening in the world. She was also in charge of the set. Um, there are many insights into feature mobile filmmaking, but set design? Well, you got to listen to this one as she comes to us from Australia. <laughs> Hey, glad you could make it to the SBP podcast. I'm going to take you across the world to Australia to meet a friend of ours who was here in San Diego last year. Remember last year, 2019 BC? BC, obviously, is before Corona uh, virus. <laughs> um, Kimberly, say hello to everyone. Hi, everyone. How are you? Everybody answer back. Lovely to be here. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Kimberly was here in San Diego last year because um, she was, um, let me see, you were the producer and you were yes. the property master, set designer. Um, the production, production manager. And production oh, the, manager. Production designer. Sorry. She <laughs> was, well, she was um, almost, uh, I mean, I, 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 so she was everything almost. <laughs> for the film called Madhouse, which took home the trophy uh, as the best feature film in 2019. And what I want Kimberly to share, because she will do this better than me, is to share a little bit about what the synopsis for the film was. Um, and then we'll, we'll get down to how uh, you can watch the film or because I want you to share that but I want I want you to show people a little bit about how someone like David or uh, Ross Perkins <laughs> um, can actually make a film with a smartphone and find someone as awesome as you to get involved with it oh thank you <laughs> <laughs> um so the synopsis of the film is based on three junkies that come across this guy's phone and he turns out to be quite wealthy and they track him down using his phone against him. And it's the film is entirely done from the perspective of the phone, so as if the phone is a character in itself. And they take... Uh, uh, Dale and his wife and daughter hostage and it's over a period of a couple of weeks there's no specific timing but you can tell that it is done over a period of time and uh, within that they they basically torture them and it's horrific what happens it's somewhat based on a true story um, it's actually based on about three stories Ooh. written together I didn't know and, that. I knew um, it was based on one, but I didn't realize it was based on three of them. Can you share a little more about that, actually? So the original story is based on a family that got um, – it was a house invasion and it was um, two guys that tortured them and then eventually burnt down the house. Now, the original story is far more horrific than what we did um, in the film, so – we, we literally waterboarded someone in the film. Um, it's pretty awful what we did. But um, then, then we took the story somewhere else where the junkies are actually based on real people here in Sydney. 
in Darlinghurst and I used to live just down the road from them and I didn't know that. I, I refer to Ross Perkins as Dave Ross, that's his nickname. So if you ever hear me say Dave Ross, that's who I mean, <laughs> the director. And uh, he had watched a um, like an episode on like 60 Minutes about these particular people, but he didn't realise that I actually had seen them in the streets and they were meth addicts. Um, were well, ice addicts here in Sydney. And uh, so we based the junkie characters off them to make them uh, more realistic. And then um, one of the junkie characters, it, um, it, this, his story goes even further, where it's based off um, a guy who literally films his death towards the end, uh, where he wants to stop this addiction, but he just doesn't know how to do it. And he has his own camera at the time, and this is from years ago in England, and he just films himself just going down the spiral. And so it's a combination of these three stories thrown together to give the characters more realism um, because when we were talking about uh, the addiction of ice, which at the time had become an issue here in Sydney in particular areas, that we wanted to show that this can actually happen to anyone. It's um, not specific. And, if, you know, just through turns in someone's life that it can take them down that track. And so we based it on real people because we have come across people like that. And it's not glamorising drugs whatsoever. And we wanted to really um, make that come across quite clearly in the film. And with the film, it's... Uh, the three junkies film themselves and everything that goes on. So through the camera, through the phone, they're telling the story. And when Dave Ross came to me and suggested this, I just thought it was one of the best things I'd heard and I had to be part of this film. I actually put off a trip to Japan and I said to my friend who I was going with, I said, I need to work on this project. Something in my soul says that this needs to be done and um, the story was just so dynamic. I had to be a part of bringing it to life and just supporting him in it all the way along. The depiction in the film um, as the festival founder, when I when I first watched the film at the beginning, um, I was not sure. I was not sure what what was going on. Right. Mm -hmm. um, I was. And, and let me let me share with our listeners what I mean by that. I mean, obviously, when you're looking at a video, you know what's going on because it's being presented to you. But what I'm what I'm saying was, um, you know, someone submitted a film, and I'm getting what looks like footage that looks very realistic. Yeah. Um, the actors, including Ross, actually lost a lot of weight for that. For that film and they really messed themselves up on purpose so to me when I started to see the characters and the acting was so realistic um it I I was part of me sort of almost wanted to stop the film and step back and say is this is this real like someone decided to commit some crime and share it as, as as a film in a film festival is this crazy or what you know and this was within the first 10 minutes of the film which is opening but and at first it opens up sort of you know kind of cool and it has that music and it has the text going back and forth because you see you know the texting and the messaging and the family you know, very kind of cool. But when it starts to bend the other way, I started thinking, oh, my God. Was that the reaction that you got that now that because when when you brought the film to the festival, it hadn't been screened before? No, it hadn't. Yeah. So <laughs> even we we hadn't seen it on a big screen at that point. So even we watched it and went, who made this sick stuff? Like David and I just <laughs> looked at each other and went, Wow. What? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and you guys were sitting at the back and watching the reactions as well. I want mm -hmm. you to talk about that too, but did anybody have that same sort of reaction when they started watching the film that 
when you showed it again at different festivals and, and different uh, places, did anyone, or, or wherever they were watching it, did anyone sort of have that same feeling? Like, is this real or, or, is it, or was it acting? Um, absolutely. Uh, we, we had a screening, so we had like a presentation to, cause a lot of the characters in the film, like you've got the lead actors, um, there's the six lead actors and they're all professional actors, um, where everyone else is rent a crowd of friends of ours. <laughs> and so we did a screening for them after we came back from San Diego cause they hadn't seen it either at that point. And so we organized a screening for them to watch it. And their reaction was just as shocked. <laughs> and it was, it was good to see, but from after seeing the reaction in San Diego, we were like, are we sure we want to show everyone what we've done? Because it's, it's so vulnerable, this film, especially when, in that case, a lot of those people knew everyone in the film and to see them in that way, they had no idea what was coming. And the looks on their faces were, they squirmed, they screamed out and they're like, oh, you know, just as much as uh, um, the reaction in San Diego. But it's uh, that's a massive compliment as well because it shows that we achieved what we were going for is showing that realism. Like even the filming of the film is gritty um, we could have used really high tech um, lenses and all that kind of stuff, but we wanted it to stay gritty to give that found footage feeling to it, like that garage 90s feel. And I think that's what really achieved it. But even I watch it and I still squirm, and I've seen it thousands of times. Wow. And uh, yeah, like especially uh, the nail scene, you know what I'm talking about. I'll leave yeah. that one alone. <laughs> and leave that for everyone to watch um, but it really does make you squirm and you feel for those characters in those moments and it makes it so relatable if it were to happen to you you'd be like oh what would you know how would you react you know um, I want to share something with you that um, when I was uh, for our listeners episodes 45 and 61 are both with uh, Ross Perkins talking about his film. 45 is right before he came to San Diego to screen the film. Go, We go really in-depth about the filmmaking part of this film and the acting and everything and the backs, a little bit of the backstories. And 61 was after he, you know, came back from San Diego with that trophy and or, or went back, I should say. Um, so I wanted to let them know about that because one of the things that I discussed with him and I wanted to get your perspective on this, was that the camera really was uh, one of the characters in the film. Oh, absolutely. So everything in that way was intentional. Um, we didn't even put up lighting because we wanted that ability to have that 360 view when the character when they were filming themselves, they could turn around at any point and you wouldn't know it was a set. So this was just filmed entirely in a house and we needed that 360 realism. And I remember Deborah specifically bringing that up at the beginning and I went 100%, I haven't actually thought of anyone doing anything like that. So that really played a huge part in, that, in the camera playing that character as well because they're passing between each other and you see them doing it it's not yep. cut yep um like within the editing he could have cut that out but he didn't and I love that because it made it seem more real that hey we're just being crazy idiots and let's just throw this camera around but yet there's even times when you see them doing it but it doesn't fault in the telling of the story and I thought even watching him direct that, I just thought that was brilliant. There were times we would just be bobbing out a shot, like, or we'd be hiding around corners and hearing everything. Mm -hmm. So a lot of it was left to um, the actors to really improvise in those moments. And we really didn't reshoot a lot of scenes, mainly because we didn't have a lot of time. <laughs> But you know what, the, the, the shots, right, the footage, um, even though it, you know, you can tell it's handheld and it's shot with the phone and all this stuff, 
things that were supposed to be in the frame were in the frame. And I, I don't want the listeners to think this is a flying around camera type of a thing. It was actually done very well considering that you've got non cinematographers <laughs> holding yeah. the phone to shoot separate scenes, uh, you know, different scenes themselves uh, as the camera people, which is pretty much unheard of. I mean, I've seen, you've seen it, right? You know, many, especially horror films where, you know, it's the, there's this one guy or this one girl holding the camera the whole time, right? And they're almost, almost forever. Cloverfield is an example, right? Um, in that film, and the camera belongs to one particular person throughout at least most of the film. But this is handed yeah. around and passed around, you know, like a drink. <laughs> a- absolutely. And and I'd never heard of anyone else doing that in that way. And it's just those tiny little things that, that um, Davros threw in there that really blew my mind to even watch even in the the dailies um that because i'm not looking through that screen because the actor is doing it and even davros wasn't looking through that screen at the time so he's really trusting his actors to really pull this together and the fact that they were so still or they just framed those shots it's not like he came in and blocked it. Like we'd do some blocking, but he wouldn't say these are the lines within that shot that needs to be um, filmed. Like he really, really trusted his actors and they just pulled it together and it just blew my mind how how they but, really but I have to did say, a good job. <laughs> I have to say that's your fault that he trusts the actors, if I can say that, because um, when I spoke with him in one of the podcasts i think it was in in the second one or the first one but in 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 one of those he actually says that he was very nervous on the first day before the actors came on the set and you were there and he was a director and of course he was also acting and he was pretty nervous and he asked you like how do how do i get the actors to do what i say you know what i mean and you told him you have to trust them. Yeah. And you were right. And, and he took that to the bank, as they say. And it really paid off. Like, I I didn't realize until, yes, you did. Yeah, you've reminded me he, um, that that was brought up. But the fact that he took that on, like, I was his support. Like, I was just to make sure that he was keeping it together to, to direct his first feature and be one of the lead characters in a film is nerve-wracking. I... I got to give him so much credit for doing that because that's a really hard thing to do, and he managed to do it. And I, but I was just making sure that he wouldn't crumble and be so stressed. I was just holding him up and going, "You can do it, buddy. You can do it." <laughs> wow. Well, you did a fantastic job, and, and and yes, I I agree with you. It's it's one of the things that I'm really impressed with, knowing that first of all, he wrote it. You know, and it wasn't, even though there was a little improvisation here and there, most of it was, was still, you know, they were, it it was, they were playing their parts. These are, most of them are theater actors as well. Mm -hmm. And then on top of that, uh, making sure that the story goes as, and flows as it's meant to. So then he has to direct and, and there's a different hat that you have to wear. So it's not like he can take one hat off and put on the other one he was literally wearing all three hats at the same time and then he was so into his character oh absolutely he committed 200 percent like even the day that we shot the final shot um and he had lost all that weight i said i'm gonna go buy you some pies right now because you (laughs) need to eat (laughs) He was just so skinny and looking so sick by the end of it. And I I literally was convincing him, you need to eat food now because this has got to stop. At this point, this is the end. We're stopping the film. And it was just so well done. And I loved the final scene like because I was there for that. And it was just It was so harsh. It, it was so harsh to watch that and then at the same time you know the you know when you're watching this film so to our listeners 
you know, I'm always preaching, I suppose, about story, how story is everything. And, you know, when you, when you um, sometimes hear, oh, it's one of those um, home invasion, found footage type things, you know, films, you always think, oh, it's just, um, it's a director's way or a filmmaker's way of, of, of a low budget film and, and trying to make it uh, without, you know, production value as far as that. Well, let me tell you something, the real production value is in the story and how well you captivate your audience. Because Mm -hmm. that, first of all, you have all the locations that you guys used. All the different things. There is no point in that film where you break away from it because you start, your mind starts wandering. Outside of being a film festival director and going, oh my God, is this real? Am I going to witness a real crime? (laughs) Outside of that, right? Once it's in the festival or it's in your screen, you know it's a movie. (laughs) Yeah. Um, And and although I'll have to tell you, if I had bumped into that on YouTube, I probably would have (laughs) had the same reaction, you know, because you don't know what you're going to get there. But quite honestly, um, this the story in this movie was so good that you're sort of wondering, wait a minute, who is the real protagonist in this film? And and the acting between all the actors, I mean, you start to think the protagonist is uh, Ross Ross's um, uh, character. What was his name in the film? Ways. Yeah. Yes. So you- so um, you think it's Wes, him. Bryce, and, uh, oh, it's been a little while. Yeah. Um, Cass, other junkies, yeah. Yes. And you start to think it's them. And then you go, well, maybe it's the family. But it's in the end when you realize it's the daughter. Yeah. You know, and the daughter, and then you go, wait a minute, actually, the camera. It's the camera. You know, that it, kind of a thing. It's actually the camera. And, like, yeah. a lot a lot of the work that um, there was the filming, there was the editing, but there was a lot of discussion even in the editing stage of how, who is the protagonist? And it was definitely how I see it, the phone. And that the phone can be your friend or your enemy. And it really depends on how you take it. But also the stories. I loved how... Um, you've got the six stories of you've got the three junkies and then you've got the three in the family and it really delves deeply into all of them and it constantly twists and turns and you really don't know where it's going to go and that's what's so beautiful about it because it when we were editing some characters actually came to the front more than others and it was mainly through the individuals and their acting that it wasn't always that clear at the beginning when it was being edited, but then we would discuss, well, I feel that this person needs to come forward because it does change the dynamics of the film. And I think that was like he, him bringing those characters forward even more. For example, Cass, she wasn't always one of the per se leads. And then as we were filming, she just came more and more to the front And I just said, you know, like, I don't know if he had always decided to do that, but there was a part of me that went, she has just got such a beautiful, unique story in itself that it needs to come to the front as well. But, yeah, I just, yeah, all the characters was just beautiful. I loved how they're individually told. And they all get their say. Yeah, you can, that's kind of like what I was going to say. You can tell that that Ross had that respect for, I, I, I mean, I know he has a lot of respect for the actors because, you know, he knows them all very well, but I, but I, I think the respect in each character. Um, and, you know, usually I, I, I've always believed that a, a person who is the camera person and the director and the person who writes it and all that stuff should never edit their film because they fall mm-hmm. in love with yeah. different things that, you know, the editor has a different focus, right? 
and and can be yeah. trusted in that way. But the real un the real unique part is that him doing the editing and actually respecting each character at the same time in that way because he was so focused on the story is really unique. Oh, yeah, 100%. The, the insane amount of hours and time that he put into editing this film was... Uh, you know the difference between genius and <laughs> the, the line between genius and crazy? Like, it was getting to those levels he would just, on a daily basis, like... Every day he would be changing and chopping and just improving and just refining and the story would change. Like every time I'd watch the film after he's had an edit, it, the story would change again and again and again. And we actually ended up, he, he ended up cutting out a lot of um, some of his favourite scenes mm. just to make that story flow even better. So, um, and it really paid off in the end because there was so much more backstory to the characters um, and that a lot of that got cut out. But some of your best stuff can end up on the cutting room floor and it, it really did. Like he could have made another film with the stuff he cut out. <laughs> but it, know, still, it, it still it, came through in the way that, that he put everything together. And I was just going to say that's, that's an artist thing too. Um, I used to do graphics design and even mm -hmm. when I edit videos or whatever, it's never really done. You're never really finished because you're creating something that's in a way yours. And yeah. it's like, you could keep adding and taking away. And as you're adding and taking away parts of it, you're sort of, um, how should I say, you're molding and you're, you're creating something um, and it's never really done. It's always transforming is what I'm trying to say. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah. you have that control. And so you never want to stop, especially when you're passionate about it. And there's a lot of passion in art. <laughs> oh, yes. He wouldn't have been able to do this with the commitment he, he put to it without having that passion like just the refining and finding that perfect balance. And mm -hmm. that's what he was looking for, was that perfect balance to get it just right. Because it was, you know, it was his baby and he just wanted the world to see. And it never wife. is. It never is just right, though. I mean, you could you could go mm -hmm. on forever. It's, it's only like, I, I know that when he came to the festival, he and I were talking and he said, yeah, I, I still think I need to make a few more edits when I get back <laughs> home, you know? And I was like, you know, yeah, no. of course. Of course you'd say that, you know what I mean? Because it, it, I, not because I saw that, but because, of course, he was so into that. And, and you know, that was his first feature film. Yeah, he lived and breathed it. And, and I'm glad he did. But there was points where I was like, okay, you know, where do you draw the line? There is, you know, like you could... You could always put more paint on a painting, mm -hmm. but there is a certain point. Where do you stop? And, and that was one of the hardest things. <laughs> the deadline. That's the one. <laughs> the deadline, yeah. <laughs> I think it's the only way to do he it. He had to yeah. get on a plane and come to San Diego, and he, so he had to stop. But then, of course, as yeah. soon as he got back, he went at it again, you know. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's it. Like, even after he got back, I'm still sure he made tweaks and edits to it. And yeah, <laughs> but you know what? Like, like that. That's up to him to do that, really. So, you know, I I can only do my part, and then that stops. And then, you know, like even when we got it to the distribution company, yeah, um, he even had to do like, uh, you know, when you all the different languages in and all that kind of stuff as well like and just making sure all of that's perfect and there's just so much more even after you finish finish the product to get the product out there that's a whole different step in distribution in itself and then that takes you on another ride so yeah where does it end <laughs> i like that you called it product because it is a product in the end i mean it's a work of art it's your baby and everything but then it's like you know it's you created this thing now you got to package it that's basically mm -hmm. what it is packaging yeah. it for distribution and that's a whole other ball game okay now listen let's talk about you really quick here 
Okay. Let's take some time to talk about you. Um, talk about the set because that was so interesting. And we're gonna we're gonna put the trailer on there, and then we're gonna put the link to the film so people can go and and watch the whole thing. But I I, I think the set right or the sets. But most of mm-hmm. it happens in one house, which happens to be his own family's house. Please share, because I know that when we did the Q&A at the festival, you you were able to speak to this a lot. And so <laughs> have at it, Kimberly. I, I, I'm not going to lie. It is quite a funny story, like how it all came about. So when he told me the concept, he goes, so my parents are going away for three weeks. <laughs> And I went, okay, and he and I'd said, I'm on. I'm on this. I want to be part of this project so much. And so his parents went away. And what he had told me and also told them was that, uh, Mum and Dad, can I just do a little bit of filming in the backyard while you're away? <laughs> <laughs> That's not how it turned out. So what we did was, because um, it's quite a large house, like, I, you know, it's pretty close to a mansion size. Yeah. A small mansion and um, in this really beautiful part of Sydney, North Sydney. And so what we did was we went around the whole entire house, filmed, uh, photographed everything, like where the mail was, where the furniture was, um, uh, anything on the walls, and uh, we just made sure that we had a record of everything. Um, so we knew to put it back in the exact same spot when his parents returned. Wow. And <laughs> which was a very fun thing to do. Um, also at the end of it said, uh, Davros, you need to clean the house before your mum and dad get back. <laughs> but it was great to have that opportunity. And the two of us actually lived there. He lived there the whole time. And I would stay a fair bit because I was also working my normal job in between that but I'd be on the train every night going up and if I wasn't able to stay there and making sure everyone got to set and we were really just trying to fit this in between everyone's jobs so we just went around the house and moved a lot of the furniture around to sort of fit our needs because we were going to be running we were literally running through the house constantly but while Dave and uh, Dave Ross and I were there um, instead of throwing our rubbish away, we would just literally throw eggshells on the ground or rubbish or pizza boxes or leave food sitting out in bowls. Or And it was to do with the continuity of the film over a period of time that the house would just, because junkies wouldn't care, like, you know, they're not going to put rubbish in the bin. And it was just little things like that. And even in the party scene, um, when we invited everyone over, um, one of the girls tried to clean up and we're like, no, 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 no. This is actually part of the set. Stop. (laughs) Don't change anything. (laughs) Leave it alone. We want the rubbish everywhere because that's what they would do. They just trashed the place. We basically trashed the house. And uh, it was fun to clean up at the end. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Um, When you came back because nobody watched the film obviously what was the reaction of the of the parents uh <laughs> well he came back with a trophy which was good right he did but we made a promise <laughs> that some of the siblings have seen the film um but we had this conversation and i said dave ross i don't think your parents should ever watch this film <laughs> And he goes, agreed, I don't think they should ever see it either because of what happens, like in their bedroom and their bathroom. (laughs) So one of the siblings actually dobbed him in and eventually they found out what we had done, but not all the details. And so so he wanted to do a separate cut just for his family. (laughs) (laughs) And totally explainable. I wouldn't want my parents to see it either. Um, And despite how, how... horrific the film comes across in certain spots behind the scenes we were having an absolute ball we had so much fun making this film it was really good to do and we just everyone came together and worked as a family and a team and just yeah loved it outside of fingernails and 
strangles yeah, 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 and yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah there's been blood here and there uh, <laughs> a little bit um yeah but, yeah was... just even but even in that we were learning all the way we were constantly learning what we could get away with what we could do um even there the scene where she escapes and runs down the road and you can hear her screaming yeah. what's disturbing is no one stopped no one stopped to help her and we we're like uh that's a reality check that's disturbing <laughs> well that's also a thing with you know uh because you know whoever i mean you're talking about real people you know not that mm. you know what i mean like here's a girl running down the street screaming and there are people who don't realize that you're making a movie right no <laughs> and they're thinking junkies and they ignore junkies yeah right? it's very true absolutely um, and the final scene though um which i'm not going to go into detail because i want to leave no. that for everyone to watch um but when we filmed that scene that was on a street so we did guerrilla film we were guerrilla filming because it's done on a phone you can do that no one questions but when that thing happens to him yeah someone did actually stop and we had to film it about three times because we were filming on a public street right and so they didn't know what was going on <laughs> Well, yeah, and that's a thing I warn people. It's like you can you can get away with a lot like that, but if you let's just say that you bring out a gun and you're waving a gun around or something like the police can come out and, you know, Oh, absolutely. someone can seriously get hurt. Um, yeah. you know, by accident. <laughs> you know. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I've I've worked in the film and theater industry here in Sydney and we have made props guns before and the rules around even making props guns where they're just uh, fiberglass, mm -hmm. uh, they're massive rules. And so when he said he wanted to use a gun, because I was the props master, so I was the one who got all organized the costumes and the um, equipment. I even, I made a bong for the first time. I've never done that. Had to call in a... <laughs> call a friend on they thought it was hilarious they said if I didn't know you so well uh, I think that you were lying but I had to call a friend and say so how do you make a bong <laughs> he thought that was hilarious um but we'd make all these props and so we did have a prop gun and uh, I said but there are only certain places and times you can use this and it needs to be put away because we don't have permits for filming on the street like we didn't use anything on the street like that um it was just acting in the street but in the house it was totally fine so um yeah interesting and even even making the pot i found is uh time and um we say oregano but you guys say oregano <laughs> oh yes yes <laughs> yeah a combination of those two you've got to find the right balance and it ends up looking like pot as well that was quite interesting and fun to make so <laughs> Yeah, someone suggested the real thing, and we said no. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me ask you uh, something about your job with all that, because you were working a, a, a regular job, and I'm sharing this with our listeners because, you know, this is, this is real life here, okay? Um, mm -hmm. So you've got, you're working on a film, and mm -hmm. you're, wear, you're wearing a, a few hats yourself. And you're coming on the train. Did you ever find yourself running running an errand on your way there from work where you're bringing stuff on the 100%. train? Yeah, constantly. Because um, I've been a costume maker for years, I'm used to traipsing suitcases all over the place on public <laughs> transport full of stuff. So quite normal to do that because uh, <laughs> in Sydney you don't really need a car. You just public transport everywhere. Um, it's probably about 45 minutes to get up to the house and well, half an hour to 45 to get there. And I'd be stopping in at a costume shop to pick up the police costumes or something like that, or going to at least book those kind of things. Cause I needed the right sizing and needed the right shoes and just checking that you've got everything correct. And then maybe I'd even get Davros to go pick something up for me, but even sourcing, I had to source needles. I had to even source a pipe, like an ice pipe, 
um, which was actually not as difficult to find as what I thought it would be. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> Um, surprisingly, I was like, oh, that was really easy. Um, and even going to the chemist to get the needles and stuff like that. And they do look at you funny. And I promise you that they do. Cause they're like, mm, you don't look like someone who'd use something like that. I'm like, no, cause I'm not. <laughs> and I just say to them, I'm actually buying this as a prop for a film. Mm-hmm. So, and they're like, oh yeah. <laughs> we get that all the time, ma'am. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I bet you do. <laughs> so yeah. It was a bit of a giggle, but um, I had to be safety person with stuff like that as well and just say, hey, don't leave these things lying around. You know, you never know who could pick them up on site because it goes into the, the realm of insurances and public liability. Like there was one point he wanted me because I did act in the film, but only really in the background because I'm not someone who likes to be on screen per se. I like to be behind the camera. But he used me as an extra because he'd be like, can you play a junkie? Can you do this? Can you do that? And there's one moment he goes, can you jump out a window from the second story? And I'm like, oh. what? No. I said, we can't get the insurances for that. So, um, yeah. So I said, not in this case. And I said, we would have to, the, the money for something like that, we just cannot afford because it's a no budget film. Like, we just couldn't do it. And I wasn't willing to risk myself because if I injured myself, I wouldn't be able to do my job, you know. Tell, tell, share a little bit about that with, with everyone. In, in, as, a, as a prop master, production manager and all that, what does that really entail? And why should someone, I mean, because, again, we're mobile film, right? So you're thinking, well, I got mm-hmm. a phone, I got the script, and, yeah, I got passion. But... Um, you know, what is the benefit of having someone like you on set besides being such a great shoulder or crutch for the director? (laughs) Yeah. Uh, I've always been a sort of a jack of all trades in that kind of way. And when he first came to me, he wanted me to do something completely different. And I said, do you know, I have all these extra skills. Um, I've done props making, art finishing, which is making costumes look old, plus making costumes, and then a bit of set production design on projects that I've worked on. Um, And I offered those to him, and he went 100% anything that you can offer. And they're just... You just... You can learn anything via YouTube these days. And, Mm -hmm. like, how do you make something look authentic? Um, I was even looking up recently how how to make a bag of a, a kilo of coke. <laughs> that was quite interesting, you know, just for um, just for fun's sake, you know, like just out of I think it's out of flour and you do this and that. It was quite clever in how they did it, uh, and it was actually by a professional props maker, mm-hmm. and just picking up all these skills over a period of time and. I don't know, I've always just, ever since I was a kid, I like to make, well, not though not paraphernalia, but I came from a country town and you learn to become very resourceful with your environment because you either, you know, you don't have the money or you come from a place that you don't have access to making props in some way. So, because um, I grew up in country New Zealand and... You know, we're, we're not third world country or anything, but coming from the country, um, you have to just learn to create things on your own and just make anything out of your environment, you know. And uh, it was always fun. So, <laughs> how, how, what, got you, <laughs> what got you from New Zealand? Um, share a little bit about your, your own personal history. What got you into this, this line of field? This. I shouldn't say line of field, but um, this this type of a career, because it is a career. Uh, ever since I was a child, I've always loved film. I've been an absolute fanatic about it, like everything to do with film. I was from the VHS days, and I would sit there watching the TV and record. I'd be two feet away from the TV recording, and Mum and Dad just had to get used to it, that that's what I did. Um <laughs> They would even buy me VHS tapes and I'd just have stacks and stacks and stacks and I just would love um, critiquing films. And when I was younger, I was like, I would love to critique films. Like, it's just something I love doing. I'd learn all the actors' names. 
Um, I was the kid that would look at the Muppets and go, I don't, I don't want the Muppet. I want to know how the Muppet works, like growing up Labyrinth and any of the Jim Henson stuff just absolutely fascinated me in costumes, like watching films like Strictly Boring, which is an Australian film, and it's about the big ball gowns and anything along those lines where it's got glitter and sparkles. And and that came out, Strictly Boring came out in, I think, two, uh, 1994. So I was about... 13, 14, about that age. And I just knew that's what I wanted to do. And even though I was a country kid, everyone thought I was a little bit crazy, to be honest, um, to follow that path. Like I I lived with people who were farmers, you know, like um, and then to want to do something like that was quite unheard of. Even Lord of the Rings hadn't come out at that point. And I just wanted to follow that path. And so when I moved to Australia, because um, I've always been an artist as well, always been a creative, that um, I came across the costume course and that just opened doors to me. And so I wanted to go down that track. And then in 2013, I ended up working on the stage show of Strictly Ballroom, which mm. was written by Baz Luhrmann. Wow. So just, I don't know, I believe if you you know wish for something hard enough and really work for it it really can happen it, like not in the way that you expect it but it definitely you know if you dream for something I believe it can come true you made the the right connections yeah like uh by doing the costume design course here in Sydney um I managed to get into the film and theater industry and just through that you just network like everyone is your ally if if you if you chat like anyone can do this like the best thing you can do is just talk to people because you have no idea what they might have in their background like even my job most people that work where I work are actually in film or theater background but you don't know that until you have a conversation with them and people really blow you away once you start asking questions and just making those connections is really powerful it is and and I know that when you guys were in San Diego you you brought people over to the film festival because you mm -hmm. have that gift of being so social yeah cuz I I met up with a couple here in Sydney and they'd come to my work and I got to spend a couple of hours with them. And I just thought they were really beautiful. And they said, Oh, are you coming over? I think at that point it was a week and a half before yeah. um, I was coming to San Diego and they said they're in, uh, from San Diego. And I said, well, I'm going over there for a film festival. And they went, really? We want to come and join. And they absolutely did. I did pre-warn them though. <laughs> I, and they go, that's okay. And I'm like, are you sure? <laughs> and they said they had an absolute ball. They loved it. Well, I have to tell you, um, I'm really glad that your film was screened in, in our festival. Um, and I, I, you know, remember uh, Steve Peterson, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, he was lovely. Yes. And, you know, we had uh, you guys and Steven, you guys hit it off also. I mean, actually, I shouldn't say, oh, it was just you guys. I mean, you guys got along with everybody there. And, you know, there was also CK and, oh, and the rest. I love of CK. Yes. I was to him <laughs> Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. so, you know, it was so wonderful to see, and, and from my perspective, to see the connections that were, you know, speaking of connections that were being made there. Um, and uh, Steve Peterson was such a wonderful person. And showing your film and his film, they were both so different from each other, but they were both very creatively done. And um, yes, and it was, you know, and I, and I, and I, I do this every time anyways, where I'm going, you don't want, children to watch this which is why we showed your film later at the end right at, yeah. at night um but you know steve peterson um he was on this podcast as well but even after uh he 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 wrote this film called assimilate which was on netflix oh wow yeah and so 
with yeah. teenage, uh, you know, heartthrob type stars and, and all this and, and Hollywood actors. And, you know, he was at our film festival, such a nice guy, didn't have, you wouldn't have known while he was there that he's a, a Hollywood screenwriter, basically. Oh, yeah, he's absolutely, he was a modest, lovely, beautiful person. And we had some really amazing conversations and just learning from each other as well. You know, he's got so much knowledge and it was just really great to meet someone like that and say, hey, you know, you can do this stuff. Yeah, and so what I I guess part of what I'm connecting here is those connections when if you're willing to talk to people um, and, you know, you're sharing stories and things like that, you, you're going to connect with people through through the stories, but then you just don't know. Um, you may come across somebody that can connect you with other people in in the same industry that you want to get into or that you're mm-hmm. in and, and can really be very helpful to you. Um, speaking of being uh, in the industry and everything, um, you've, you've worked on some films and you've done, this is mainly what you do is, um, is work on, I know that we went to, it looked like the set of Pulp Fiction on the last day, remember we had dinner at Denny's here in San Diego. Yeah, <laughs> I loved it. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it was so much fun uh, because you and and David Ross were from um, or Ross Perkins, whatever guys. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you guys were both from Australia, and I I wanted to treat you to like an all American meal, and it was probably around close to midnight I think around that time right oh, it was so much fun and I loved it I can even remember what I had it tasted really good <laughs> me too because I had strawberries I think I had like a strawberry waffle or a strawberry crepes or something yeah. like that it was so delicious and we we had such a good time uh doing that and um but I, what was my point? I was going to get to something with that. Oh, yeah. So we we went there. We went to Denny's and everything. But then the next day, you headed out to, and I, I just want to share this with people because it was from San Diego. You went, you rented a car. And where did you go? You had an adventure. Okay, so, so from there, <laughs> uh, I went to Salt Lake City, grabbed a car, drove up to um, Wyoming and went around Yellowstone Park by myself. Then, and I was just camping in the back of the truck and it had been snowing for the first (laughs) couple of days I was there. Went to Utah, to Moab. Okay. So that's the um, Arches National Park. And then uh, flew down to New Orleans and from there, went over to uh, Orlando and went to NASA because, you know, I'm a mass, massive NASA nerd. Love that kind of stuff. Then flew to Washington and caught up with my friend who had popped down from New York and we went around Washington and that was amazing. And then we caught a bus up to New York. Wow. And um, I stayed there and it was just one of – I would have to say of all the trips I've done in my life, it was the most incredible trip I've done. And just starting off with meeting you guys, just, it just, it started off with a bang and it was just incredible. It was was like highlight of my life. (laughs) It was so, it was so, so wonderful to, to kind of follow you on Facebook and Instagram and everything. Uh, Follow your trip. How long did that take you? Uh, so I was there a total of three weeks, and I think I made nine flights in wow. that whole time. One extra flight because I got diverted. No, um, something happened in Orlando, and then a whole bunch of us missed a flight, and so we had to go via Atlanta <laughs> to Washington. It was so, so wonderful. To to, I did. <laughs> yeah, it was so wonderful to, to see that. Um, one more thing are you what are you working on next 
Uh, so there's a few scripts coming up that friends are writing and just polishing up at this um, point. Um, Davros is actually working on one at the moment. I can't really go into it at this point, but um, he's just polishing his script on that, and it's the next big one he'd like to do. He's is working on, on a the phone. No, this one's actually um, he's upgraded to a Black Magic. Oh, nice um, camera. And he's made up a dolly and just – I've watched him practicing using the dolly and just getting these really smooth, beautiful shots and really good color grading and just stepping up the levels. I still believe in um, filming on a phone. Like it is I'm, – I could not say any more about it. Like the phone is a fantastic, versatile way to film. Um, but he wants to try a different style of filming. And I think he's just experimenting and trying um, different ways of doing things. And and it's all just part of learning. You know, it, every time you do a project, it's completely unique. Yes. So you- and, uh, and, and, you know, in, in my case, right, so I can totally support the mobile filmmaking and I and I f- and, and that's my thing. But at the same time, uh, I support the artist and the filmmaker. You know, this is just mm-hmm. one way to do it. Um, and he's going to, I'm sure he's going to uh, share a really good story and put everything that he's learned from his phone into the next mm-hmm. film with a, with a black magic camera as well. Oh, absolutely. It's all about refining and changing and experimenting and do, doing something new. And as long as, as long as the story is really good it, the format it's put in it comes secondary yeah to that like I believe story is always first like when I read scripts that people send to me I'm looking for that something that's unique and different like taking a relatable story but then twisting it and going oh that's so different and new I love it you know but really heartfelt and grabbing you at the same time how many, uh, you know, from different people who who read screenplays and, and scripts, whatever you want to call it, um, they usually say it's the first page, and if it doesn't grab them by the first page, they drop it, they go on to another one or something like that. How do you do that? Um, I, I guess majority of that's quite right. Uh, if it doesn't grab me, do I want to keep on reading? But usually they're people I know. And so I'm always going to give it 100% and read it because there might be a diamond in there somewhere that um, you could take that one moment and then expand on that. And that could be a completely new, different story. Like uh, I've like, I've got my friend in New York, She's a um, she produces her own music and she'll have samples here and there, but then she'll go take elements of songs she's written and then throw in it into something completely new. So I believe with the story, it's the same kind of thing. Like there might be that little diamond you're looking for, that little nugget of gold, and it might be at the end of the story, but you just don't know until you read right to the end. So you can always go back to that person and say, hey, mm, have you thought about this idea True. You know, as a concept? <laughs> yeah. No, and, and you're right. And there are many, many, many movies out there that, that you can watch, um, you know, especially during lockdown or whatever. It doesn't matter. You could, they're, they're just there, and you can watch them. But there's always, there's always a few. There's a, there's a lot of great films, but there's always a few, though, just a few out of all the great films that really, really make you feel something that just sticks with you. You know, mm-hmm. after you watch the film, whenever I watch a film that has a really good story, you know, and that I've felt emotions and, you know, I don't always have to cry, okay, but <laughs> yeah. But sometimes it does, you know, um, especially when you watch it the first time. But a movie like that, I, you know, when it's over, you feel like, especially I think it's because I'm in this field too. It's like, oh, I want to make a movie. You know what I mean? Yes. I want to make a movie. Or when I was, you know, before that, it's like, you know, I, I'd watch 
a film that was maybe say up on top of a mountain or something like that. It's like, I want to get out on a mountain, you know, uh, it has to do Inspiring. with yeah. yeah, whatever it is, you know, it, it does. It, it's actually that exactly that it inspires you in some way. And there are very few films out there that do that. And so, um, I guess if I could, you know, say something to our listeners is to work on your story first um and and steve remember steve peterson said something i'll never forget this because he said if you if you film with your phone if you if you write a screenplay to be filmed on a phone it's gonna get made yeah because they're keeping it a go in the first place you know yeah i mean you're gonna shoot it with a phone i mean why wouldn't it get made you you have a your opportunity for that the odds are are better on your side that it's going to get exactly. made. Exactly, you have far less roadblocks with a phone than what you do with going through the higher processes of having someone who does graphic design or, um, you know, you, you going down that track. It's it it just it's mind boggling. It even scares me when I think about it. If you're going up the ranks in like different types of cameras and even just for mobility, the phone is the absolute best way you can go. Like I've had in my old house, like around the same time we were filming um, our film, uh, one of Davros's friends came over and he was part of the Sydney Film School and he turned up with 15 people, massive cameras, lighting rigs, all this kind of stuff, and took over the house <laughs> where it, and it was really claustrophobic in comparison to when we filmed with the camera with the phone camera right like it just did not feel like that at all we felt really free like even in the party scene uh there's only about six people that know their lines and davros and i were the only ones who actually knew what was going on and so we just said to everyone just mingle have fun and we were just walking through and everyone who was at at the party had no idea (laughs) and it was only until after everything was edited they went Oh, okay, that's what was going on. And they, and that meant that everyone is really natural. And when you watch it, you probably think they're acting those crazy, doing those crazy things. No, nope. just give our renter crowd a bunch of alcohol and that's them just being themselves. And they were okay <laughs> with that being part of the film? Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. That was them just being, the, being them. <laughs> you know, <laughs> they weren't, they weren't acting, they were probably acting up, but they yeah. weren't acting they were yeah. like with the the painting over the head you know like that was actually a real moment oh. <laughs> that ended up in the um in the film yeah even even the scene where he falls off the chair um oh yes that scene's one of my favorites where at the party he falls off the chair right i ended up rolling with laughter um i fell over on the ground because i was sitting doing the music for the scene Um, just off my laptop, just so the dancer could get the timing right. And um, Brando was on a seat and he falls off the back. But the thing is, the reason why I'm laughing so hard is when he falls through the hedge, he actually falls about a metre and a half. And no one at the party actually knew that. I knew that. (laughs) But he disappears and it's because he's gone off a cliff. (laughs) (laughs) And I just could not stop laughing. And we did that in one shot. And I went, you cannot script that. <laughs> and then and then you go and you win an Emmy Award on that one scene. <laughs> I was dying of laughter. It was so good. I just couldn't believe it. I said, cut. I, Davros didn't say cut. I went cut. I went, cut. We're not refilming that. That is perfect. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Take two. Um, yeah, it, it's... Definitely not. There's so much work involved in film, uh, but what they say, like it, like you know, like in in some of these offbeat sports or rock climbing or you know whatever, they say you know you work hard, you play hard, you know, and it, it, it's kind of like that. You do have a lot of fun, but you work oh, really yes. hard. You work really hard. Yeah. yeah, there was dedication from everyone. Like my. 99% of everyone there was working and this was a Monday, a Tuesday, like that party scene's on a Monday. 
you know, and it was the only time we could get everyone together because a lot of us work weekends. And so it was just really like one of the hardest things was coordinating everyone, especially within that three-week slot. Like it was quite difficult. But luckily because we did it in winter, it was easier to access everyone. Hmm. If we'd done it in summer, there's no way. No one would have turned up. They would have all just gone to the beach. (laughs) 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 That's what mostly happens. So winter time's actually a really good time to film. And even having those storms as well that were ended up in the film were real. Wow. Wasn't made up. Yeah. Awesome. Well Yeah. Kimberly, is there anything that you would like to share that we haven't touched on? I can't think of anything that comes to mind directly, but I have to say just coming to the film festival last year was one of the most amazing things that I've done in my life, just meeting everyone there, um, yourself, CK, Aaron, uh, Nathan, and Stephen, and they're just the names off the top of my head that I can remember, just meeting people like yourself, going, hey, we're not alone on this, and working as a team. Like, you and I have stayed in contact on an almost weekly basis, especially around Taco Tuesday. (laughs) Um, You know? And uh, just having that connection and just going, you know, with that support of each other, it makes a massive difference to know that you've got someone that you can talk to and ask for advice or learn from each other watching everyone else's films. Like, um, uh, is it Alexandra? Yes. Yeah, her yep. film, absolutely incredible. Like, yes. just blew my mind. I was, like, in tears. And then to watch CK's film, 61 Hugs, I have shown that to so many people. And that was actually part of the US story. When I went to, I was in Idaho Mm. going up to um, Yellowstone Park and I had to go to Walmart. And this young guy came up to me and he was helping me at at Walmart. I needed some blankets. I needed some equipment for camping, right? And at the end of it, he was just so lovely. And I gave him the biggest hug. Mm -hmm. He goes, is there anything else I can help you with? And and I went, hang on, there's one more thing. He ran from one side of the shop to the other to go and get it. And then he came out and I gave him another hug. And it just was the most beautiful thing. And I went, oh, so everyone watched 61 Hugs. It's brilliant. <laughs> oh, right. And, you know, I was joking around with Aaron and I was telling him uh, and got to give a shout out to uh, Aaron Nabus, our from our team. Um, I was I was telling him, I said, you know, had we had to present... Um, this is before we went to lockdown, right? But we are, the coronavirus thing was already going on. Could you imagine having to present uh, 61 hugs during keep your distance, wear oh. your face? I was, like, I was like, that would not have worked out, you know? No, it wouldn't have. And it's just, it's heartbreaking that we can't be like that at the moment, you know? Connection physically and emotionally is so important to human beings and the fact that we've we've been held back from doing that it makes us appreciate it even more yeah and watching a film like that just oh makes you melt well <laughs> yeah and everybody went around everybody I mean remember he did the Q&A and then I, I can't remember who it was I said well can I get a hug <laughs> I think it was, I think it was me. Probably. I think I ran up and went, I want to give you a big oh, hug. Oh, it was you. It was you. <laughs> I was like, oh. <laughs> yeah. So adorable. And it's stuff like that, a really simple concept and just twisting it and comp- taking it in a completely unique way. I'd never thought about, when you watch something like that, you just go, how did you come up with that? And it's just so beautifully done, so simple but beautifully done and so courageous because I don't know if I could have done what CK did. Like, to be honest, like, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm a really engaging and social person, but to do what he did, that's really courageous. Well, he's all about challenges. Mm-hmm, you know? yeah. Uh, CK Golding is who we're talking about. He's also been on the podcast uh, a few times. Now he's got his own podcast. The film festival experience was awesome. It was great meeting you. It was great meeting everyone 
you know, it was <laughs> it's sad to say that this was a year ago and some, um, and it took this long to get you here on the podcast, uh, which I feel bad about. But in, on the other yeah, hand, no, it's a testament. It's so <laughs> yeah, it's a testament that we're we're still connected, uh, which is great. So. Oh, we're going to be connected for a long time. I promise you that. Like, oh, yeah. Just well, keeping up to date. And, uh, <laughs> and, and not only that, you have a phone. So, you know. <laughs> that is true. <laughs> you can make a short. You don't have to go all out and make a feature. But if you want to, hey. <laughs> oh, yeah, like constantly I'm writing down little notes on my phone, just titles of films or a concept of a film. And I came up with one the other day that I can't say at this point, but I might turn it into a short film. Ooh. And it was actually, it was just made off a, a, a statement that, it's actually from the statement that Simon Cowell said in the article that CK wrote. And I went, hmm, that's interesting. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take that somewhere and just make a short out of it. And it really just takes that little nugget of inspiration to go hey could I make a short could I make like medium length or a feature film out of it and that's probably one of the hardest things is how much do you make <laughs> there's also uh, a combination to what happens sometimes is you you meet somebody or you see somebody or you witness somebody and you see something quirky or something something about that person that makes them stand out and you're saying I'm going to put that in my next film. I'm going to make a character. I'm going to make a story around a character, you know, mm -hmm. based on somebody I watched or something like that, or even a quote, right? Yeah. Well, that's it. It's just anything can inspire you. Like, for example, um, you know, even even though we were going into winter just before lockdown, well, and we, as we're going into lockdown, all the spring flowers came out. And it just blew my mind. I was just like, why? And it was so unusual. And then all the animals came out that would never do that. We have a family of birds that live with us now. <laughs> like, yeah. you know, that just didn't happen before. And uh, scuba diving lately, the water is so clear. And it's just taking those little moments and going, you know, you could just take any concept and ride with it as long as, as, long as you connect with it and you feel that other people will too, you never know what you can come up with. I do have a little tip for our listeners who are even thinking about making films or for some of you who have, who have been making films in the past that um, I know we're all going through this, right, Kimberly, where there's, there's a lot of talk about how, this is, how people can't make films anymore. Mm. But there's, there's two sides to making film. There's the filming part, and then there's the editing part. Mm -hmm. And you can take, just like you can take um, a story, like uh, a Shakespeare story, like Romeo and Juliet, and turn it into Leonardo DiCaprio and, uh, and the Titanic. <laughs> you can yeah. also take a footage that you've already shot. And most people shoot a lot with their phones. Yeah. Um, and you can take footage and films that you've shot and remake uh, another story from it, another film. You can do musicals and montage. You can make experimental films. You can make documentaries. You can do all sorts of things. So I just wanted to somehow kind of inspire people that are out there, um, since I'm stuck on that word now, um, <laughs> uh, to not get down and not let the situation get down and realize that you have, you probably have a way to make films, even if you're not out there filming them right now. Yeah. Well, if anyone's needing any inspiration on how others have been doing it through lockdown, um, have you heard of Homemade? It's on Netflix. Hmm. I'll have to check so, that one out. Definitely check it out. So um, I watched it the other day. It's just a whole bunch of short films of people who have oh, um, made them. Yeah, it's all the shorts that um, have to do with lockdown. Every single one of them is completely unique and different. And I just I thought some of them were really beautifully done. But the one that really jumped out at me, and, and 
the reason why it did was because of its simplicity rather than trying to be too artistic in yeah. a way, if yeah. you know what I mean. Um, so did you watch all of them? I did. I, well, almost all of them. It, yeah. Are you going to bring up the one with the little girl? Um, the one, yeah. So it's these two that I really loved is um, there's the Rachel Morrison with the five-year-old at yes. the beginning, about the third one in, beautifully shot, and it's about just be five. And I just thought that that made me cry. Not gonna lie, <laughs> it made me well, cry. Yeah. But the other one that really stood out, and even though she is a filmmaker, um, Garinda Chada, who wrote, um, she filmed ben, Bend It Like Beckham. She's an English director. Hmm. Um, and she's been very successful in the industry. But what I loved was she could have made it fancy, but she didn't. She just showed her experience with her family. She just st stuck to the basics and just really showed her experience and the fact that um, lockdown was actually a gift and that is to have time with your family. And she actually did lose, I think, her mother through it as well. So, mm. you know, it's so sad to watch. But she just kept it really simple. She didn't um, go over the top creative in any way. Like she just really stuck mm. to what made her happy and it's just so relatable. Like she could have, you know, been a huge filmmaker. She could have gone down the other track, but she chose not to. And that's what was so heartbreakingly beautiful about it was it it was the most relatable out of all the lockdown films that I saw anyway, to me personally. True. So if you want to be inspired, watch other films as well. And and not everything not everything that you make in lockdown has to do with lockdown. Uh, it's no, just a you know, it's just the fact that you <laughs> lockdown is such a <laughs> harsh world looking at it is you're, you're in solitary confinement. That makes it even worse. Yeah. Um, but you're you're basically limited in, in where you can go, what you can do and things like that to a point. Um, on the other hand, if you go for a walk and you you're able to shoot some stuff while you're out for a walk, it's a good mm -hmm. time to see things that are usually crowded with people blocking the view of different things if you know what I mean yeah absolutely like even uh, lately my friend in New York has walked around the streets of New York and it's just completely empty yeah it's so neat and, yeah it's with all the boards up and I was just like wow it looks like another world like right. <laughs> and I've been to New York quite a few times and I've never seen it like that, and, but it's also presented opportunities for that that backdrop. Yeah. Like if you're doing like a zombie film or if you're, you know, I know that you, you have to social distance, but it um, depends on how you write your script as well. Like how do you decide to go about that story then as long as you stick to the rules, you never know what you could come up with. Yeah, you could I just, start I think, capturing B-roll for your next, you know, Exactly. B-roll is the first one I'd do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's what I'm all about. All righty. Where can people follow you? Where can people follow me? Okay. Uh, <laughs> I've been meaning to set this up for ages. So um, I had not pre-planned that question. Um, I, I do have Instagram, actually, but I've, I haven't had the opportunity lately. I'll Hang on. I'll come up with the... I've got so many Instagrams. So my personal Instagram, and I will be adding stuff to it uh, soon, it's called Monkey Mansion Productions. So monkey, like the monkey, mansion, like the building, and then productions. Um, and you'll see an image of a monkey. And, yeah, so I will be – so that's to do with a previous um, short film that um, one of the girls who was – in Madhouse, um, she won a short film festival um, just before we came to San Diego, actually. Nice. And, uh, so you'll see that posted on there. But the next thing I will be posting is, um, it shows how busy I have been in the last year, <laughs> um, that Madhouse will be the next thing that I am posting on um, Monkey Mansion Productions. So 
That is in the works, yes. So cool. on Instagram. <laughs> awesome. Well, we'll we'll share a link to it as well, just in case. Um, yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you for coming on the show. Uh, say goodbye to everybody. Uh, well, th thank you, everyone, and also Susie. Just everything you do is amazing. You're so supportive, and like just staying in contact with you. Just you bring this little light into our lives that I just love. So <laughs> always have a good little giggle, and I love your little posts on Facebook as well. I always have a laugh. Um, but knowing that you guys are there and that we can talk about these things, knowing that there is that support to to learn and grow. I just I just want to thank you for that because coming to San Diego last year was absolutely mind blowing. And I really appreciate it. And so does Davros like a hundred million percent. So thank you so much for that. <laughs> and I can't wait to catch up with you again. Definitely. Thank you all for listening and we'll see you soon, maybe in San Diego, but at least on your phone. <laughs>